In this video, I will introduce you to the important concept that the linear model implies a correlation matrix. This is something that you will typically run into uh, in more advanced texts, but I think it's a very useful principle to understand even on, on the first course on quantitative analysis. So linear model is any model where all the relationships are linear. For example, regression model and correlation matrix quantifies the linear associations between each variable, two variables at a time on a standardized metric. So what does it mean that the linear model implies a correlation matrix? Let's take a look at this path, this regression model in the path diagram form. So we have three different independent variables x1, x2 and x3 linked to dependent variable y with regression coefficients for these regression paths. Then we have some variation u, the error term that the model doesn't explain. And then we have these x's that are allowed to be freely correlated. The correlation is uh, shown by this two-headed curved arrow. What this uh, principle says that uh, the, the, the correlations between the x variables are what the data gives us. So we can just calculate the correlation with x1 and x2 and that is taken as it is. Then that we say that the correlations are free. But the correlation involving y depend on the model. So we can say that uh, the correlation between x1 and y depends on, on these correlations and the model parameters here. So it's implied by the model. What that means that is that we practically, in practice, we start from x1 and we, we trace paths. So we can check how we get from, from beta 1 to y in different ways. And then we uh, trace all possible paths. We take a sum of those paths and then that will provide us what is the correlation with x1 and why. Let's take a look at an example. This is an important concept because if you understand this concept it will uh, allow you to understand certain properties of regression analysis in a lot deeper level than you otherwise would and it's also very useful when you think of factor analysis or structural equation models or other more complicated models. Let's do the, uh, the tracing. So the idea of path analysis tracing rules is that we pick one, two variables. If we want to calculate the correlation between two variables, we pick x1 and y. Then we check how many different ways we can get from x1 to y. And we can only go along these arrows down, or we can travel up and then along one that cur curved arrow and then down, back down again. So from x1, we can get to y in three different ways. We can go along the direct regression path here. We can go from x1, one correlation to x2. We can't go this anymore because we can only take one correlation down to y. Then we go x1 to x3 and down to y. And that's all three paths that we can take from x1 to y. So this uh, gives us the, uh, the following equation. So we can check that the correlation between x1 and y is the sum of the direct path plus this correlational path times the direct path from x2 plus the correlation with x1 and x3 times the direct path from x3. What's the interpretation of this correlation here, the equation? It is that the correlation between x and y equals the direct effect plus any spurious effects because x1 is correlated with x2 and x3 that both are effects of both have effects on y. So we are saying that this correlation actually here is a product of this relationship of interest plus these spurious other causes or common causes of y that correlate with x. So that's the, the idea. So we get this uh, these three paths we multiply everything along the, each path and then we take the sum of these paths. So here the path from x1 to x2 includes the correlation here in, and includes the regression path here. So we multiply those to get the value of the path. We sum all the paths that gives us the correlation. The importance of this rule will be uh, made clear in a few slides. So that gives us the correlations, but uh, we also need uh, the variances of, of variables. So that those are implied by the model as well. Now we are working on correlation metric 
which means that the correlation is one but that one is something that the model implies as well. So uh, when we have the variance of y we have to think how many different ways we can go from y to somewhere and then come back. So we can go to error term, we can go up once then we turn back. So that is the variance of the error term times one and times one again because we go back and forth. Then we have y to, to x1. The variance of x1 is, is one because we are working with standardized data and we come back. So we have beta one times one times beta one on the way back. So beta one squared. The same for x2 and back and x3 and back. Then we have a way of going from y to x1 then one correlation to x2 and back to y. So that will be beta 1 times the correlation times beta 2 and we can take the same path the opposite direction x2 correlation and back. So we get that and that produces us gives us the, the following math. So we have the direct effects beta 1 squared plus beta 2 squared plus beta 3 squared. So we go from x1 and back, x2 and back, x3 and back. So that we because we back, go back and forth we have beta 1 twice or beta 1 squared because we multiply things together. Then we have the correlational paths between two R. We go x1 and x2 and then back and we go the uh, x2, x1 and then back. So that's why multiply by two. We do, do that for each variable its pair of variables and then we have the variance of error term. So that gives us the variance of y with in correlated data. Correlational matrix is always one. So we can use these rules to calculate the full correlation matrix between all variables in our data. So we have here the variables of, of x's. The variances of all variables of, of x's are ones because that's we are working on correlations and then uh, the correlation between x's are something that are given in our data and then we have these equations for correlation between y and x1, y and x2, y and x3 and then variance of y which is uh, the, co the covariance of, of the variable with itself. So that equation and this is the variance of the error term, not the, not the actual value. So why would this kind of model be uh, or principle be useful? The reason is that if we know this correlation matrix from the data then we can actually uh, calculate the regression effect estimates. So we can also work backwards so we know the correlations in the data and then we can find out what set of regression coefficients beta 1, beta 2 and beta 3 and the variance of the error term would be compatible with this correlation matrix. So we can we can find the model parameters beta 1, beta 2, beta 3 and variance of u the error term that produced this implied correlation matrix. So let's do that. Heckman's paper gives us a correlation matrix of all the variables. So they give the correlations for the variables before doing the interactions. So we can uh, calculate this part of the model one here using the correlations. We get estimates that are very close to one another. So we can see that this is a minus a 23 and this is a minus 23. So they are mostly uh, the same. There is some, some inaccuracy because in precision because these are just two digits precision and the correlations are two digits precision. So we have some rounding errors and also we have these interaction terms here in the model that in their model that we don't have in, in this model because they didn't present the correlations between these interactions and the other variables. But the, the results are mostly the same. There is one important question now. If we look at the, the p-values, the p-values or they don't present the p-values but they present the stars. So we tend to have less stars than they have in the paper. So it's an important question when we replicate something if we don't get the right result, the same result, then why that's the case. To start to understand why the p-values from our replication is, uh, are different from Heckman's paper is useful because it teaches you something about statistical analysis. So remember that the p-value is uh, defined by the standard error, the estimate and 
the reference distribution against which we compare the t-statistic which is the ratio of the estimate and the standard error. The estimates here are about the same as the estimates here. So uh, what could be difference, different is the standard errors. Somehow we calculate standard errors differently than they do. For example, because we don't include these variables in the model, it is possible that our standard errors are larger. That's an unlikely explanation, but it's possible. And because our standard errors are larger than in Heckman's paper, then uh, that leads to the p-value differences. So let's check uh, if that is a plausible explanation for the differences. To understand uh, where, if that's a plausible explanation, we have to consider uh, where the standard errors come from in a regression analysis. One way to calculate the standard errors is uh, an equation that looks like that. And remember that we calculate the p-value by comparing the, the uh, estimate divided by standard error against the t-distribution. And uh, so could our standard errors be different? So are the values that we, we use different from the Heckman's paper? The first thing that we notice that there are the r square here for this is a r square in the formula refers to a r square of one independent variable on every other variable in the model. So we calculate the standard error for, for one variable by calculating this uh, the r square of that variable on every other independent variable. So that r square j tells what is unique in one independent variable compared to other independent variables. This term here some, has some additional meanings that I will explain in, in uh, a video a bit later. So if we omit variables, so Heckman's study had 15 independent variables in the first model because they had three interaction terms, we only have 12. And we know that if we add variables to a model then r square can only decrease. So uh, r square can only increase, so our r square should be a bit smaller than Heckman's r square because we have less variables in the model, we don't have the interactions. If this r square j decreases, then uh, 1 minus r square, this subtraction result increases and this causes the denominator to increase here. So we have a, a larger denomination here, which basically means that uh, the standard errors will be smaller if we have a, but just based on that consideration. So if our standard errors are smaller, then we know that our p-value should be smaller as well, because the estimate divided by standard error will be larger when standard error gets smaller, and it will be further from zero, which means a smaller p-value. Then, uh, okay, so what happens, what's on the, uh, here on the top, that's the variance of the error term. In our paper, it is, our model is 75, so it's 1 minus r square is the variance of the, uh, the error term in, in standardized results. So ours is 0 0.75, Heckman's is 0. He Heckman's 0 0.75, ours is 0 0.78, so there's a 4% point difference. So uh, because the, we can expect this uh, denominator here to be smaller and the numerator to be uh, a bit larger, then uh, we are expecting the r square, the, uh, the variation or the standard error to be perhaps about the same. So we can't really look at the standard errors and, and conclude that there is a, a clear reason to believe that our standard errors will be substantially different. So we conclude that uh, based on looking at where the standard errors come from, then uh, we can't see a clear reason why our standard errors would be larger than in Heckman's paper. So that's an unlikely explanation. So why do the p-values then differ? If we have the same estimates and we have no reason to believe that the standard errors differ substantially, then uh, what remains as a plausible explanation is that uh, we are comparing this estimate divided by standard error, the t-statistic, against a different distribution than Heckman, 
and that will produce the different p-values. So uh, if we divide our p-values by two, we can actually get the same stars as Heckman mostly. So that's an interesting observation. Our p-values appear to be twice as large as the p-values by Heckman. Why would that be the case? Well, this is an indication of Heckman actually using a one tail tests instead of two tail tests. So the difference in one and two tail tests is that in one tail test you only look at the one end of the tail so you will get the same significance level with a smaller value of the, uh, of the test statistic. So here you have value of uh, 1.7 required for the 5% significance level and here with two tail tests because this area here must sum to 5% we have about, about two for the same problem. So when with one tail test, you basically take the p-value of two tail test and you divide it by half. Because it is a convention to use two tail tests, then reporting one tail tests, doing one tail tests and not reporting that you did so, is uh, basically the same as claiming that you did two tail tests. And that's uh, a bit unethical. Generally, there is uh, very little good reasons. I can't name any good reasons for using one tail tests. And for example, Abelson's book on statistical arguments explicitly says that uh, using two tail, one tail tests instead of two tail tests is, is practically cheating. What's interesting is that when Heckman's paper was under review, so he has published the, uh, the full revision history of his paper, and they included a mention that they use one tail tests and you can see many papers actually do use one tail tests without really justifying that choice. So the choice is unjustified but they nevertheless want to do it presumably because it makes the p-value smaller and results look better. But they had, they mentioned which is uh, the, the right thing to do that the p-values are one tailed for some reason that part of the, uh, of the regression table footer was eliminated from the published version. So the rule of thumb, don't use one tail test. There is really no good reason for using one tail tests. And if you do, report it clearly, but you really shouldn't.